Um, so my name is Will Howard. I'm the lead software engineer for Flash Scientific Technology. Calvin needs no introduction. He's a, he's a man of many talents. <laughs> but we worked on a very exciting project and it's still ongoing and we, we continue to um, do some enhancements, um, you know, as we'll see later in the later in the presentation to the foundation that um, we've built sort of a, a weather intelligence platform. Um, you know, initially what we worked with with Six Feet Up was predicting lightning and we're, we still continue to refine this product, but it's it's very exciting. And this is kind of our big, our the name of the company is Flash, obviously. So um, <laughs> lightning is somewhat of our specialty. Um, very well named company, Will. Yeah, yeah, I, I didn't come up with it. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes, sometimes I'm like, you know, it could maybe be a little better than Flash, but anyways, it makes us sound fast if nothing else. So, <laughs> um, so, so today we're going to be kind of giving an overview of the product and the platform and various tools that we use to implement it. Um, it's, it's a really exciting um, topic in, in the lens of um, big data delivery and big data dissemination. Um, so I, I think it's fun and anybody with an interest in data and especially with weather, I think we'll, we'll, we'll find this pretty, pretty neat. So um, we'll start by outlining kind of the product and the platform and I need to get clicked on the right thing. Um, <clears throat> this is, this slide sort of serves to show um, the power of what we're doing, you know, pre predictive lightning forecasts. Um, especially you think about lightning as one of these ephemeral magical occurrences, right? Where it's just all of a sudden a bolt comes down from the sky. They, they named a Greek God that does something like that. Who knows? Um, <laughs> but we, we've developed an algorithm um, to really accurately um, predict the onset and the cessation of lightning. Um, you know, onset usually 15 to 20 minutes and cessation, um, same, same kind of time frame, 15 or 20 minutes. Um, so that, that has a lot of power for a lot of industries and just kind of personal safety, right? You know, like the current rule is the last bolt of lightning or rumble of thunder. You have to sit there, <laughs> sit there and wait for an hour or 15 or minutes or 30 minutes, depending on where you are, um, for your child's t-ball game to resume um, or for the plane to taxi down the runway. And that's that, that I think kind of shows the utility of this sort of tooling um across across media or across use right cases. and will i mean the current state of the technology was we only knew where lightning was in the past like when you got a lightning warning on your tv or on your radio that wasn't predicting lightning anywhere that was just like lightning is in the area we saw it correct yeah so there's the the large and quite robust lightning detection network um you know, in any product that you see right now that shows lightning, most of the time it's kind of happening in real time. There's these cool little circles and these indicators. Um, that's real-time lightning from the Lightning Detection Network, which is a network of physical-based sensors um, that re registers the electrification of the air. It's actually kind of kind of cool. So that's a whole different thing. Though. Um, but there's been no, <clears throat> no really um, software-based or, or modeling um, focused on lightning, right? And, and that's somewhat of what we're doing. So um, this is a really powerful example of a jet skier in Florida. Really, this was really early on in the product development. Um, so the, the, the model has actually become much more skillful since then. Um, and we actually have a, a nice uh, product to, to, to display as opposed to, you know, this little Google, the, the Google Maps powerful, but you know, we're, we're building things. <laughs> um, so, so this shows the location of somebody riding their jet ski happily, having a great time, not necessarily knowing that there's a thunderstorm coming in. Um, and here we see as, as, as the storm advances, our earlier lightning strikes predicted over here, sort of on land, um, that's 310. <clears throat> and three minutes later, um, as the storm has advanced, the algorithm begins to predict lightning really close to the user's location, right? And so this is this is a forecast output from 313. Um, the person was not struck by lightning until somewhere in the 330, 335. Oh yeah, 337. <laughs> 337 area. Now I don't know what's called at 340. Um, you know, if we had a functional product at this point in time, we could have delivered a warning to this person that lightning was imminent at their location in the next 10 minutes or 20 minutes. Um, 
and we think about the potential for lives to be saved um, and for infrastructure activities to be un uninterrupted in this situation and it's pretty powerful um, so I think that's yeah. a I think one of the other interesting user stories that your co-founder or founder of the flash project mentions is around air travel and the amount of money saved possible potential savings for this kind of technology applied to the scheduling of airlines I mean it's it's mind-boggling what a simple delay costs in uh, in fees, services, all the things that kind of just like cascade from something I don't think about too much when I go buy an airplane ticket. Yeah, I mean, for a, for a plane to idle on a runway, it's using a any uh, at least one, but I think it was multiple of gallons of jet fuel per minute. Um, and I think they were all pretty sensitive to uh, the cost of fuel right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so especially jet fuel, right? They, if you have a plane that has to idle for 15 minutes and then once the lightning ends, idle for another 15 minutes before it can take off um, the, you know, Delta Airlines or United Airlines or we're working with Spirit Airlines right now. Um, the, the potential for cost savings and the benefit of that is almost boundless. So, oops, I didn't mean to press that button, but I guess we're going to go to the next slide. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, there's just a little overview of the project. Um, you know, I showed that the high level, uh, high level demonstration last slide. Um, this algorithm was developed by Jason Deese. He was a long-term research meteorologist um, at the National Weather Service in the Atlanta area. He was working there for about 25 years. Um, and it's actually kind of cool, right, to, to think about some of the parallels between how a person learns in their normal course of work and maybe how a machine can learn, right? Um, he has just looked at enough weather data and seen enough storms that he's, you know, you know, mapped some correlations in his mind and, and then eventually um, began to put these into a, a more computational um, program. Um, so <laughs> this algorithm that he developed was developed completely in Jupyter Notebooks, um, you know, a really powerful tool for some prototyping and just kind of ease of use to get something stood up. Um, but that was where we started was from a couple, uh, you know, a, a couple of sloppy Jupyter Notebooks, I will say. Took a little while to, to pick them apart. <laughs> um, so where, where we came in, um, where I started with the company and where Six Weeks Up started, you know, the, the next week, um, was taking this sort of locally run proof of concept um, to a minimum viable product, fully cloud native, um, that was capable of delivering these algorithms forecasts to anybody and disseminating them to anybody through a RESTful API um, in a performant manner. And so that was that was kind of the whole thing. And um, Calvin, do you have anything else to say about yeah, the high level? I think that the the power of Jupyter Notebooks is really important here because it allowed a scientist to communicate to another group effectively. I've got an idea, I, this is how this is supposed to work, but obviously it's kind of hard to productionize or to deploy a Jupyter notebook into a, a, a enterprise environment where you need to service, you know, tens of thousands of requests or hundreds of requests per minute, you know, type level of scale. But it allows someone like Jason who's you know, he's not necessarily a Python hardcore developer, but he was able to actually take those ideas that were in his head, you know, from a science background, being able to now work with a, a group of technologists, I think was really powerful. And I, I think that's a pattern we're going to see uh, more and more over the years to come is, is folks who have these kinds of ideas being able to easily jot them down because of the power of, of Python and Jupyter Notebooks and tools like Pandas that are relatively accessible, I think, to those who you know, aren't necessarily coders. Definitely, definitely. I mean, yeah. And Will, you have a background in, in uh, science and weather as well, right? Yep, I am a meteorologist by education. Um, I'm a, I'm a yeah, atmospheric scientist, uh, bachelor of science. And yeah, so I find that to be powerful is that you've got two folks who are really the atmospheric scientists that are dabbling now, or not dabbling, but are really officially working in the hardcore land of like deploying this into a, a cloud native scalable you know, type area and doing it with relatively minimal resources. Yeah, yeah, we're a small company. So um, it's myself and we've got a, a, a 
you know, machine learning specialist who is also a meteorologist. So really it's, we've got four meteorologists running a software company, <laughs> but I've, I, I have switched. I've, I've been um, a software engineer now for. So, sounds um, like there's a joke in there someplace when four meteorologists <laughs> walk into a bar. How many meteorologists? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, there might be a couple options for a couple jokes <laughs> in different places. Um, so, you know, from, from going to this sort of locally run, and it's actually somewhat funny, right? Um, the first, the very first deck of business requirements I got said everything runs in Jupyter Notebooks. So maybe we'll have five laptops running Jupyter Notebooks in different parts of the country that can send data to people. And I was like, you have just, that's not how it works, right? Cloud native is where we're going. And so here we are. Um, <laughs> and with, with with taking this, this to a fully cloud native solution, um, there were a couple of challenges that were need to be hashed out initially. Um, primarily, you know, data ingest, right? We, we deal with a lot of data. Um, every five minutes from 183 different Nexrad stations across the country, 159, yeah, it's 49 terminal Doppler weather radar stations, but we'll leave the, the acronyms <laughs> on the side. Um, every five minutes, we get, a, we get a full volume scan from every radar station. Um, if the atmosphere is very busy, the scans can be up to 15 megabytes. Um, and so that's, you know, quite a bit of data every hour. Um, and then the other part that we have to um, kind of validate the radar against is uh, various weather models, right? Um, in this basic algorithm, we're using the, the rapid refresh model, the RAP. Um, the RAP runs every hour. Um, and the RAP's kind of an older model. So we, we're now using the, also the high resolution rapid refresh, which is the same as the RAP sort of, but runs every 15 minutes. Um, <laughs> and that's a lot of data too. Um, so, so we, we, we ingest this weather data, we ingest the, the real-time Nextrad data and then the, the forecast model data um, and then do all of our fancy slicing and dicing and, and everything we need to do to prepare the data to, to deliver a forecast. Um, and then we also have to deliver the forecast, right? <laughs> and sometimes these are very large um, in, a, in an active thunderstorm. The amount of uh, locations that meet the criteria that are are fruitful for lightning generation, <laughs> lightning genesis, I guess you could say, um, can be really busy. I think Calvin's seen some of these large returns where we just have, um, you know, thousands and thousands of for forecast strikes for within a ten mile radius of a of a user's yeah. location, um, and that's also pretty powerful <laughs> to see from an end user perspective. It's like, oh yeah, I really am in a dangerous area. I mean. Granted, I want to say that you could just look up at the clouds, but you know, anyways. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so, Will's not kidding about the size of this, some of these data sets, and also the fact that they're stored in not necessarily modern formats or processes. I mean, these, these weather systems are sometimes you're FTPing data from a place or you're interacting with a server over kind of a web dev like protocol. I felt like I stepped back 10 years in web technology, uh, but this is the state of the art in, in weather right now. Yeah, yeah, it is, it is. I mean, a lot of them are, you know, primarily, right, the weather data is coming from government entities and not to bash the government, but sometimes their accessibility of their technical products is a little bit behind. <laughs> <laughs> that's just not their focus, right? So. They're not super, that's, that's not what they're there to do. Um, so we, we were tasked with being handed a stack of Jupyter notebooks that if you pressed a button with certain coordinates and you wanted a lightning forecast, we're taking about 30 seconds um, to run. And, and that was driving me crazy. The first time I saw it, I was like, what? <laughs> um, and also, I mean, there is no, I, I mentioned here, right? Portable GeoJSON format. There is no consideration for the output format or what is something that somebody else can use to make this uh, a forecast that we can disseminate across, you know, either a technical audience who's building their own products and integrating ours, or that we can display on our own, right? So the, the, there are some decisions that had to be made um, with how do we deliver a forecast. Um, but right. you know, we no, no one's going to wait. No one's going to wait thirty seconds for an API call to finish to get back a forecast. Yeah, I mean, what is the 
what is the stat that people won't even wait five seconds for a web page to, to lose, yeah. load before 90 percent of them bounce so <laughs> like coming from coming from the lens of you know previous work being really um user facing web pages i, I was like this just isn't even close to something that can work <laughs> so these are kind of the challenges that we set out um seeking to seeking to solve right and and some of them were had multiple methods that we could resolve them um but through working with engineers at six feet up and and some some ideas of my own about how everything would work we came up with a really powerful architecture and um we will start going down that road now i believe so yeah yeah so i for us it was important to make this project cloud native from the start <laughs> I mean, we, we started on this last year and it was an excellent opportunity to take some of the knowledge and techniques we've learned through modern web application development and apply it to a scientific realm to deploy an API that can respond quickly to these needs. But first we had to get that 30 second processing time, you know, cut way down. Um, and luckily given the ease of use of Python, it's very easy to mock something out and maybe it's a naive implementation, but it's easy then to kind of refactor, refactor quickly and then pull out the essence of what really needs to happen and add in optimizations later. So I think the power of the Python language and allowing you to optimize after you figured out how to get to a solution really showed through here. And then being able to take that same technique and go to the cloud and be able to scale uh, using serverless technologies is actually really a big advantage here for a small group. Normally, I wouldn't suggest to a group to start building lots of microservices because that sounds like something that's going to take a lot of maintenance and a lot of overhead. But in this case, it actually made sense for this use. We were actually building very, very small discrete services that were handling specific uh, parts of the problem separately. So what was one Jupyter notebook to start with got exploded out into many subsequent working parts that were working together and coordinating through things like a Redis cache. So we're actually being able to uh, take those Nextrad scans. Uh, one of the awesome features of the Amazon Web Services Cloud was they actually pr provide a feed of whenever Noah sends those Nextrads into an S3 bucket, there's a topic we can all subscribe to. And I'll, I'll talk a little more about that when we get into some of the architecture, but we were able to leverage some pre-existing feeds of data to actually kickstart and build some things like Lambdas to you know, start ingesting that data, doing some minimal processing to it, so that by the time it reaches the API endpoints that are consumed by those business users, the, the response time is much faster. I don't, what's the current response time right now on the, the API endpoints? I mean, we're in the you know, one to two seconds type range. Uh, it depends on it depends on the endpoints. So we have a we have a nationwide streaming endpoint, um, the, the Conus endpoint, and it's more of a pseudo stream. Um, but we can talk about that later. Yeah. Uh, and th those responses are about six seconds, but those are for hundreds of thousands of forecasts for every radar station across the country. Yeah. Forecast for an individual person, you say, where is the lightning 10 miles around me? Those are about a half second, 500 milliseconds. Oh, that's, yeah, that's, that, that, that was, you know, it feels good when you can take something from 30 seconds down to a half a second and, and then deploy that into a scalable cloud infrastructure is, yeah. is really it's awesome. But, you know, we'll talk a bit about how we got there. Uh, a lot of that comes down to, you know, the foundations and the, the underpinnings and like how, how development actually happens so that others can collaborate on the same problem. Well, I know that since we've been working on the project with Will, he's gone on and taken these same patterns and then just reapplied them to now implement. I mean, you've got numerous new services you're starting to offer inside the platform, correct? Yep, correct. Um, yeah. those, those later on with the, the ML ops and other products. Yeah. So going cloud native here gave us a lot of advantages where we didn't have to figure out scaling, load balancing, you know, being able to, if there's, you know, consuming all this data, where it comes from, where it goes to, a lot of those things are kind of built in and we just started leveraging those things right away. Uh, if we actually want to go into the developer experience, I'll kind of walk up from the developer experience into the deployed experience to give an overview of you know, some of the advantages we experienced you know, going through this process. When you're working on a microservice type architecture, which this was kind of a pseudo microservice, there's still a kind of monolithic Django instance in the background that's serving the APIs, but a lot of the supporting services are nice and small and discrete. So it made sense for those to be developed on their own as individual microservices. But when you're developing locally, 
you want to have those collections of certain microservices available. And that obviously proves to be a challenge. If you're dealing with cloud native technologies, but I'm developing on my laptop, uh, there's a little bit of a parity mismatch that can kind of happen if you don't kind of plan for that. And I've, I've, we've got some forward thinking thoughts that we'll, I'll get into later about that as well. But we are able through think, tools like Docker containers and Docker Oops. Compose. Oh, if you want to go back. Yep, sorry. Oh, gosh. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> so using doc, Docker containers and Docker Compose, the developers can look, work locally with basically the same kind of images and containers that they're going to deploy in that cloud. So in this diagram here, uh, a lot of the infrastructure you know, may initially start out with some API calls using the CLI to build up some things or clicking, you know, as we call it, click salad through the AWS console. But we try to distill those down into Terraform in our case, so we can deploy this infrastructure, including all the needed build infrastructure. So whether it be uh, the GitLab pieces here that are actually uh, where the pipelines run, where the repositories are stored, those are actually managed by Terraform. In addition to, and this is still kind of developer experience, the container repositories, the build lambdas, the code build pipelines, the uh, code artifact um, repositories. So we will be deploying things like taking, taking that notebook and splitting it apart also meant we had to have some commonality between them that were used amongst each of the pieces. For example, building a model and being able to deploy that model across not only the Django instance where it's serving up the re responses, but the ingestion may actually benefit from having parts of that model since we can handle some of the computation at that serverless piece, which enables obviously scaling horizontally nearly infinitely. I mean, for all intents and purposes, the cloud is almost infinitely uh, elastic for this use case. And it worked out well for us, but then deploying, lo you know, developing locally gives a developer that velocity to make changes quickly. So making changes quickly, seeing the effect of your code without having to go through the whole deploy process to see what's going on uh, allows for turnaround of a lot of quick features, a lot of quick bug fixes, uh, being able to run the unit tests locally against the model. Also another big benefit because you can watch for regressions much easier, run that through the CI pipelines and run testing there. And so that, that's how we tried to structure uh, this part of the developer experience. If we want to talk about the deployment experience, Oh, actually, before I get into the deployment experience, uh, go to the next slide, though, because this does talk about the developer experience still. If you've ever used AWS Lambda, typically you pick a runtime, uh, whether it be Java or Python or Node, or there's, there's a whole bunch of them kind of all available to you if you're clicking through the, the console to set up your own Lambdas. To make things easier and kind of level that playing field, all things in this project are built out of images. So we're actually able to use containers now. And this was an announcement from about a year and a half ago or almost two years ago that Amazon now supports container images for Lambda. So I can specify in my Lambda, go grab this container out of the container repository and deploy, which means I can now test, I can run locally and all the things run exactly like they're gonna run inside of Amazon. So that is pretty easy to do if you've got the right uh, images, base images ready to go. Uh, if we go on the next slide here, generally when you're doing this, you're going to take one of the stock Python or whatever language you choose images, base images from Amazon. And then you, this, is, this is a full working example right here of a Docker file that would deploy whatever handler you have configured or coded up into the app.py module in your project. This grabs the base container for a Lambda, Python Lambda. So we're using these containers for Lambda, you have to use special base containers because that's what how Lambda understands how to you know, deploy those and what entry points are needed for it to handle your requests. But if you have a C dependency built into your project, and in this case, we are doing, uh, we got NumPy as a dependency and a couple other things that may actually need to compile some code yeah, Pirate's uh, the big one. Pirate yeah, exactly. One it's a, and, there, and speaking of big ones, it, it, cool it, it does become challenging when there are large dependencies that are C dependencies because not everything's native Python. Now, if we look at the next uh, slide here, this is kind of the, the next step. Uh, what we did is actually leverage uh, multi-stage builds in Docker containers. And so we instead of starting off with the base image from Amazon for that Lambda, we start off with what that base image is based off of, which is Amazon Linux. So we grab the Amazon Linux image, which is a full-blown you know, Linux, you know, like an Ubuntu, like a Debian, 
uh, looking, I think it's based on CentOS or Red Hat. But that case, yeah, because we're using Yum here. Now I can install my development tools, uh, put in the extras for the Python 3.8 environment. And now I'm able to actually build my Python dependencies that would include any kind of C uh, compiles in them inside this stage of the build. So you can see the from Amazon Linux 2 as build. That's marking this as the build stage of my pipeline for the container build. What we do is actually build these into wheels. So we make a, a directory called like slash app slash wheels, build all the anything, build everything for this platform and this environment and that architecture, save those wheels into a, a common directory. And you'll see the little dot, dot, dot here. If we go to the next stage of this build, stage two, this should look familiar. We've got the uh, Lambda base image now. And we set up all of our standard like virtual environments for uh, working with Python inside of that, that image. Uh, and then we copy the requirements file in. So basically what we did in the last step, we're gonna need that same requirements file again. We copy over the wheels that we just compiled from the last stage into this image now. And then we run our pip install against those uh, wheels passing in that as basically the source of where we get our packages from. And now we can basically copy our code in this dependent on all that. With this technique, now we've compiled custom C libraries, roll them into wheels that are specific to this architecture, and we can now deploy them into Lambda and have them scale just like any other Lambda would. But we've now got kind of not your standard use case, uh, but it's a nice elegant way to do this. One other tip I'll, I'll add in here that we do use is, uh, I'll put a shout out in here for uh, pip tools. Pip tools is an awesome package for managing dependencies and being able to pin them with hashes and do the um, uh, dependency checking. Uh, actually, if you go back a slide, I didn't call that out, but you'll see that these pip installs use the flag dash dash no depths. And that actually helps in this case to speed up our image build process. Like the image build timings are faster because I'm not using pips dependency resolver. I have pre built those dependencies and pre-figured out what the dependencies are using pip tools compile that I don't need pip to do it for me. So now when I get into here, I can say no depths, just to do, what, do what's in the file. I, I really know what I mean. And it goes a lot faster and it really leads to um, very repeatable builds because all of the requirements that are in that text file, specifically you have all the hashes and I already have all the dependencies uh, figured out for us. Totally. And the, and the, the no dependencies, right. I'm sure that we've all dealt with yeah. <laughs> um, dependency resolution nightmares or, you know, whatever you call circular dependency hell or something like that. Um, this is a really powerful way to, to resolve that. Right. And, and to tell, especially when you get into some of these meteorological libraries that we're working on <clears throat> for some reason, right. Why does pi art depend on numpy like 1.1 1. 1 point, whatever. And, and then you go over to SciPy and SciPy is a different one. And then you just, uh, it, it, it became pretty chaotic very early on in our, <laughs> in yeah. our work. <clears throat> and so being able to resolve that sort of circular dependency nightmare that we sometimes find ourselves in, um, in a way like this, has really just like expedited any other future development, right? And 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 um, you know to to go back a second to the developer experience of developing these locally, right? Especially for a lambda, it's it's maybe somewhat arduous, right? If you have to build a lambda and then deploy it and then wait for a message to come in or whatever um, to see if it works, but we can you know uh, mimic that whole environment locally, which is one of the biggest things that's uh, <laughs> increase my velocity working on this project is that I can build a Docker container locally. And from the command line, um, I can curl a JSON that represents the SNS notification that I expect to receive from the National Weather Service and see it all run right there, um, just, as yeah. it, just as it does in the cloud. And that's been one of the most powerful benefits of, of containerizing the code that we're putting into the into the lambdas like this. So yeah, I think you anecdotally told me that you'd planned two weeks for a feature, and how long did it end up taking you to implement? Uh, a couple of days. A couple of days. I, well, that's, that's the pseudo that's, streaming endpoint. So yeah, <laughs> but, it really speeds things up. And you're true. The other point you made about the PyR and and some of these scientific libraries, there's just a bazillion ways they all build their libraries too. You know, from make files to using Conda to not not having a standard process that works in the kind of modern pip pipeline was obviously a challenge. And I, this, this pattern seemed to really level that playing field and get things moving faster.
definitely because everything that i deal with is i'm having to extract conda from it right and then yeah you know, my coworker who's um our machine learning expert or, or um kind of on that side of thing he's all conda and he hands me this code and i'm like oh yeah we, we don't use conda but <laughs> well, that's on me to back that up but <laughs> well, we'll go back to stage two yeah i think we actually can go into the the deploy deployed experience now so this is the result of the Terraform running now and getting this all live into the Amazon cloud. Uh, you can see that, that basically we start on that left side going across. Noah drops those next red files into a bucket. That next step, the uh, kind of reddish box right below the, the S3 bucket is the SNS notifications. So the lambdas are just fully event driven in this case. They will look at the SNS notifications coming in determine if it's useful or not useful for the use cases we're looking for, and then process those incoming chunks from the next red data. Uh, the Lambda below is, is a more of a timed one where we've got a combination of event-driven Lambdas that are running and ones that are running on specific schedules. Uh, Will had mentioned the, um, the RAD data, no, RAP data. The RAP data coming in kind of a, at an hourly-ish basis, uh, which is very true, it's ish. Uh, none of these things are exact, but they are on a schedule. So some of these things can be scheduled that we check for, you know, the, the instance or occurrence of new data being delivered, and then process that and push that into the whole system. Uh, on the back side, in kind of the bigger boxes in the middle there, we're using Fargate to deploy these Django containers, and we can deploy those containers in different configurations. Whether we're doing Celery task processing, uh, we're dealing with WebSocket or serial socket data for some of the tests or just deploying uh, the like the APIs themselves. And so we can actually configure uh, different characteristics for those various parts of the run. Behind the scenes, we're using you know, RDS for the database. I think we're actually using the Postgres Aurora, which gives us you know, that nice scaling in the cloud and not worrying about running Postgres servers and patching them. Everything here you see is running in a serverless fashion where we're letting Amazon take on the responsibility of patching the underlying infrastructure. And we're responsible for deploying the latest versions of our images in our code, you know, making sure that they get security checks done to any libraries we're using. So that shared responsibility model works really well in the cloud here. The other piece, the other next to the RDS icon at the very bottom is ElastiCache where we're using Redis to basically be our go-to for fast data. So things that are processing in any of the lambdas or things that are processing in the Django instance, they're all talking to that same Redis cache and being able to um, deploy you know, updates to the models, to the, to the responses very, very quickly to people. Now, if you're gonna do something like this, where you're gonna have Redis available to some system outside of just Django, because it's pretty common for folks to use uh, Redis as a cache inside your Django instances. But keep in mind that the Django Redis package itself kind of thinks it's only gonna be talking to itself. Uh, and it stores data in Redis in a way that's kind of specific to itself. You can work around it, but I'll just get a word of warning in there for anyone who does attempt something like this. If you're going to talk to Redis outside of it and consume it inside of Django, you're going to have to pay attention to how you either are serializing or using custom classes to access that, um, that Redis data, because you're going to want to make sure that it's kind of got a, a common uh, lingua franca of the of Redis cache that everyone's talking or else you're in for uh, crazy edge case bugs that you'll be tra tracking down for literally two weeks straight, uh, which I can tell you we were there. Uh, but once we got that worked out, man, did the responses get fast. Yeah, blazingly fast. And that was, <laughs> that was uh, I think that was the big, the big difference maker, right? And then also our, our ability to, Calvin touched on serialization, right? Our ability to serialize data, um, really what would be large amounts of data um, serialize and compress it in this common form has allowed us to expand, um, <clears throat> like I mentioned, from the wrap to the her to this MRMS data, which is we don't need to start talking about the weather nerd stuff, um, <laughs> to we've got like seven different data sources, satellite data, we're ingesting a lot of that now. And it allows us to, to keep this data compressed and serialized in a common format where anytime we build another microservice or a service in Django that would need to consume the data, we know how to speak the language of the data, right? And we know how to mm -hmm. take these really, really big files and whether it's with a BLOSC compression or an LZ4 compression um, and a combination of pickling, we can pass it around to any service that we want 
and it really allows our um i don't want to say pseudo because it really is microservices but it's not microservices in the, in the it's it's serverless microservices right um allows us to consume this data from one central location across the whole infrastructure and that's mm -hmm. that's the powerful one of the most powerful things that's uh, really enhanced our uh, speeds and response times and our ability to develop um, other other products. So. Yep, yep. So the next level of developer experience is what I want to get at is when we did a, a bit of a retrospective on the project, I think this is a missing piece was we had a lot of the, this problem solved by just using Docker Compose alone. The last bit of it that we really needed to solve was adding a tool like local stack into that um, toolkit we're using on a, our local machines, because then we can more easily sim, uh, um, simulate things like those SNS topics coming in. We could even build a proxy to listen to SNS topics in the cloud and actually bring them into our, our local machine and re replay them into our little mini version of the cloud. So I, I think tools like local stack will actually help us get away from having to deploy to see it really work um, to fully working locally. I think Will had talked about having to curl an SNS notification to simulate it happening locally. I think that we can take that to the next step and actually do the real deal locally uh, using tools like lo local stack. Uh, another thing I still want to work on for the next level developer experience is going to be speeding up even further that container building process. I think there's still ways uh, Docker has been moving forward with, with the container spec and the build kit too offers a lot of opportunities to cache images and pre-cache elements of prior, prior builds and, and use those caches to build your images. Uh, I know maybe we're spoiled and we don't have to sit and wait for our C compiles to, to run anymore before we can see like the output, but I, the Docker build time, build time sometimes feels like we're waiting for a C compiler to, to wrap up on us. And I'm like, well, come on, this can go faster, I swear. And the last one we wanna uh, do is, Code Artifact is basically a PyPy inside of Amazon, and it can be a little tricky to deal with if you're trying to deal with or use private repositories, because obviously we don't want to like publish these libraries out to the general public, but we do want to leverage the power of a PyPy-like tool. And so I think there's some more things to do around making Code Artifact easier to use. And I know you've got some next stages or next steps for this project as well, Will, correct? Correct. Yeah, it's uh, we we built on the the foundation that has been laid, um, and and ultimately we can think about, um, you know, we are a, a, a an atmospheric sciences, a meteorological operational intelligence company, but the core of what allows us to be operational intelligence for the meteorological community or for anybody that cares about meteorological parameters. I don't know who cares about the weather. Um, <laughs> I think we all do. <laughs> so our ability, yeah, exactly. Is uh, our ability to, uh, you know, process and disseminate just massive amounts of data, right? Um, I don't want to say that we're a data company, but, you know, that's, that's what makes us valuable in some ways. Um, so I mentioned it a little while ago, um, the pseudo streaming that I've built <laughs> for every radar across the country allows a single endpoint to disseminate a lightning forecast for the whole country, you know, and, and it's taking seven seconds right now, which is a little slower than I would like, but at the same time, we're, we're doing a lot of uh, validation on the strikes internally to make sure that they are in areas with um, certain atmospheric parameters that they are really are, uh, lightning potential, not just uh, radar artifacts, because that's a whole other, <laughs> that's a whole other uh, weather realm, right, is, is, is what is good radar data. And it's not all good radar data. You pick up these things that are like dust storms, right, have a certain reflectivity, or um, they call it chaff, and we don't see it that often. But the military <laughs> uses chaff to, to uh, interfere with uh, other countries' radars for various purposes, namely planes and stuff. But, you know, we'll see chaff around uh, Air Force bases, and those could pick up and signal lightning returns based on some of the, the variables that we put. So we've really had to, like, uh, <coughs> tighten up and, and evaluate the data that we are forecasting on. Um, and, and the foundation that we've established has allowed us to do that really rapidly, through the use of Docker containers and through my ability to develop um, and, and prototype changes within a microservice in a Lambda uh, locally and run it really fast. Um, <laughs> so this, the streaming was kind of one of the bigger ones. 
um, to be able to have a, a, a nationwide endpoint established quickly, right? And, and from a business perspective, that's been one of the most valuable things that we've been able to, to communicate with people is like, yeah, the point, for, the point forecasts are really cool. Think about being an end user, having an event-driven architecture based on uh, polling of your device, your cell phone, and our servers, and you're riding your bike down the street, and maybe you didn't look at the big thunderstorm in front of you, then you got a push notification that hey, you're going to get struck by lightning in 10 minutes. That's pretty cool, you know, and that's that's, <laughs> that's part of what we're, we're, we're gone with this. Um, and then also, you know, I, I've touched on a couple different times, but our validation of forecasts um, based on the MRMS and the, the high resolution wrap refresh data, um, we're able to do this with completely um, minimal and non-noticeable amounts of latency. Um, so we're developing a really skillful product and we're deploying really skillful forecasts um, through this. And then um, where we're going now, which is just incredibly exciting and maybe we can talk about it after the in the face-to-face the -face, but um our new machine learning operations weather forecasts um so we're doing short-term hazard forecasting based on machine learning models and and less so based on the primitive equations of fluid dynamics that <laughs> describe the atmosphere and so the the short term you know the five minute onset of precipitation forecasts or five minute wind forecasts or 15 minute tornado forecasts um, we're kind of seeking to um, revolutionize short-term hazard forecasting um, in this cloud-native architecture um, that, that we've developed. And so we'll see a little bit of that now. Yeah, and so pardon my architecture diagrams are not as nice as Calvin's. Um, <laughs> I don't get to make them as often. I'm usually wallowing in code. But just, just for example, right? Um, and and this is a this is an architecture diagram that would change with some containers in the middle of it, right? Oh, whoops, whoops, whoops! I pressed the wrong button. Um, you know, there there's certain certainly a lot of this can be containerized, but you know, we as we seek to expand from the basic physical evaluation of the atmosphere, the radar, into this machine learning, um, we've got various SNS topics. We've got um, data that's hosted other in other places besides the, the Amazon cloud. Um, we can still process these in that same sort of microservices, um, serverless Lambda, Lambda configuration that we've been talking about, um, utilizing storage buckets or Redis in, in different parts. Um, buckets make the most sense for some of the early stages of the data, just based on the size of them and, and um, the, we're, we're kind of running a pre-compute model, so we don't need uh, super minimal latency here. Um, and then we, we, you know, put all of our data together, grid it onto a common meteorological format, and then stick that in Elastic Hash Redis um, so that the inference machines can get it really fast because we're running an inference forecast every two minutes um, with new MRMS data. So every two minutes we can say, what is the, 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 the hazard in your area for the next five minutes of high wind or heavy precipitation? And we're backing that out to an hour um, and, and different, different temporal resolutions um, with, with, with inference being run on these, these machine learning models that we've trained and developed locally. Um, maybe at some point we could put it all in like more of a TensorFlow type architecture where training is automated, um, but that's down the road when there's more than <laughs> more people than I building infrastructure. So, <laughs> and uh, yeah, you know, like from, from the inference, then we have another, another kind of processing step to make this data again, something that we can disseminate in a rapidly portable manner to end users. Um, and then we put that data in Redis, right? Back in the shared Redis cluster that we've been talking so much about for Django. Um, and so now we've got, you know, a really robust system that's all communicating through this local um, shared data state in, in Elastic Cache and Redis. And this allows us to develop a deploy and disseminate a really, really complex <laughs> machine learning forecast um, in a trivial amount of time and almost an imperceptible amount of time to latency to an end user. Um, and that's, that's incredible. Yeah. <clears throat> It's so. really amazing what, what can be done now with a little bit of Python and a little bit of Django and a lot of cloud.
and uh, just a little bit of hard work and dedication, <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of love. <laughs> but, awesome. Yeah, so that's uh, that's that, and we've got some time for questions. 